I bid you welcome. I bid you good day. As we explore a subject that is not a particularly favorite one, however, being that it is so prevalent upon the earth, that it is one that can take someone's breath away, and in fact someone's life away, it is well that we explore it, that we give it a little bit more perspective than the one that you receive on a daily basis. The subject, then, is war. Humanity and war. What it means, what it does, why it exists, how long it has existed, and how much longer it will continue. What is it, then, about humanity that makes war on each other or on itself? What is the meaning of war? Well, to begin with, war is an archetype. War is an archetype for that which is incomplete, for that which is inconsistent, for that which does not recognize itself or know itself. War is that which is seeking its complement, in essence, which is peace or knowing or understanding. So a war is an effort to understand one's opponent, to make peace with one's opponent, but perhaps, as you see, in ways that are not necessarily those that would be of the highest order or the more peaceful. In this case, then, war is a lower choice of the lower mind. You have many different minds within you, many different ones that you can choose from. And war is one of the lower aspects. It is not one of the highest options, rather obviously. However, it belongs to the human mind. Remember that, as I have said, there are many different minds that are yours. There is a divine mind. There is an ascending mind, the mind that is always seeking the next best answer or alternative or discovery. That is an ascending mind. And the lower mind, then, concerns itself with those things that it does not understand, that it has not yet found a way to cope with, to deal with, to integrate. War, then, is the outer expression of the inability to reconcile certain truths within. And what the mind or the aspect of humanity that cannot reconcile from within, that is when things begin to play themselves without. Perhaps you can use this expression, this metaphor, to detail other areas of your life. If there is a question that you can readily answer for yourself within, then it need not play itself without in your outer reality. But perhaps you can think of a problem or a situation that you cannot quite resolve. That is when it plays out upon the world stage, your world stage, or the grander one, in this case where humanity is concerned, so that you can see it from different perspectives, so that you can step into it and out of it, onto the stage and off the stage, exploring something completely, perhaps by participating in it, or by voting upon it, or even by looking away with disdain or disgust. So those things that play out in the physical realm, in the third dimensional realm, are those things that are in some way inconsistent to the mind or incomplete. Think again of another example, that of relationships. It is so very important, human relationships, family relationships, intimate relationships. This as well is an inconsistency, the aspect of humanity that feels alone, individual, separate. It seeks union. It seeks to merge with itself, but it cannot quite discover or remember how to do that. So relationships then become individual. They become ones that you explore, move about in the world, each one assisting you in discovering more about yourself. 
Therefore, why does war exist? It exists because it assists humanity in discovering more about itself. It is attempting to resolve things that are inconsistent or unknown about life itself. It is attempting on a collective scale, on a collective consciousness, to answer questions such as what is the meaning of life? Does life indeed have value and purpose? How significant or important is one or many human lives or the idea or ideals by which others live? If we can look at the subject of war, not the act or the actions involved in war, but the entire subject of it, you would see that it involves in some ways strategies, in other ways powers and power struggles, positions and authorities, mysteries and that which is covert, discoveries of treasure or the claiming of those things that are of value or the reclaiming of those things. It is the establishment or breach of boundaries. It explores the world of trust and mistrust. So you see the very subject of war encompasses many, many subjects that humanity finds of interest and important in its own human development. Of course, how war plays out on the actual battlefields that experience or expression, that is one that humanity is still testing. On the one hand, it abhors war and says no more and looks away. On the other hand, the moment it is wronged in one way or another, it makes war upon another and upon itself. You may say to yourself, oh no, I am incapable of war. And that may very well be true, that you are incapable of war in the battlefield, you see. That you are incapable of war in the theater of battle. But in the theater of your own life, well, you make war on yourself daily. You make war upon your own thoughts, relegating some of them, enslaving some of them empowering others whether or not they are correct and pushing them out into the front. Small, innocent thoughts like youthful soldiers and you push them out into the front to fend for themselves or with very little preparation for a certain world. So you see in one way or another in your own mind field of thoughts the idea of war perpetuates within you and so in some way within the human consciousness within the lower mind it also plays out within and without to say the lower mind is not to compliment or deny a compliment to humanity the human mind is very multi-layered. It is meant to explore many different capacities, those of the highest and those of the lowest. It is dynamic. It is dimensional. And in the same way that you would explore the second dimension of gnomes and fairies and natural energies, you also choose to explore the dimension of aggression, of personal affront, of protection and such. So we begin to see that like it or not, where the personality is concerned, there is purpose yet to the idea of war. Again, the idea of war is simply the attempt on humanity's lower mind to reconcile certain aspects of itself that it has not yet found a way to reconcile through the higher mind. When a humanity, when a particular species grows and expands and discovers more about itself, like a switch, it is able to move from a lower mind to a higher mind and in that way explore the same subject with a deeper understanding, with a pause and without the possibility of having to create the experiences upon the physical. So the theater of the mind rather than the theater of the battle field. Currently, upon the third dimension, humanity where this subject 
is concerned, still chooses the lower mind here. It is not to judge itself, it is simply based on what it knows about itself. Now, where did humanity find the idea of war? Has it always, always made only war? In some ways, yes. Because in the way that humanity was created, the idea of the human being created, in this idea, there were many different sub-ideas or sub-switches, if you like. Turned on, turned off, turned on, turned off. And some of these, where some of humanity is concerned, just as you might imagine, were turned on in some individuals and off in others. This then begs the question, is every human being capable of war? No. Some individuals are not. Again, it is not better or not better. Here we are speaking of war, please. We are not here the exploring the complete idea of whether a human being is capable of taking the life of another. We are not here speaking of murder, for instance. We are speaking of the subject of war, battles. In that way, then, no, not every human being is capable of making war on another, no matter what the circumstance. Is this the same of having some that are aggressive and some that are passive? No, that takes place in a different part of the brain, the different aspect of higher mind and lower mind. Again, the subject of war is a different theater that the mind creates altogether. In this way, then, certain human being types, yes, as much as you may see yourself with different races, different beliefs, there are many different, several different human being types upon the earth at these times. Some are then capable of participating in the idea of war within and without, and some are not. Those that are not are not better than the rest. They are arranged to discover, to resolve conflict or such ideas of boundaries in different ways. It is important as we explore this subject then to remain very, very open-minded without judgment. For almost automatically you would say to yourself, those who make war on others are not as good, as nice, as evolved, as conscious as those who do. And here I will surprise you by telling you otherwise, that those who make war on each other or on another country or on another company or what it will be are not necessarily more or less evolved consciously. It is a different arrangement. And it would be wise to say as well that peace in many ways is not the opposite of war. It is in opposition to war. That is not the same as to say that it is its opposite. It has a different scale. The scale of peace is in opposition. It is juxtaposed to that of war. But it is not its opposite. The opposite, if you like, of war is the understanding of humanity or the understanding of one's opponent. It is to acknowledge the equality of one's opponent. It is to understand the situation at hand. It is the higher quality of beingness, to allow something to be as it is without the need or the strong desire to change it or to affect it or to wash over it or to wash it away altogether. Has there always been war upon the earth? Yes. Yes, for the most part, yes. With small exceptions, with small pockets upon the earth, with small pockets of time separating these. Yes. 
there has been war upon the earth. Why? Well, in some ways because the earth, because Gaia allowed it. Yes, Gaia allows that there is war. In the set of rules, if you like, rules of engagement, how to engage a planet, how to engage life on a planet, war is allowed upon the earth. It is allowed upon certain worlds. It is not allowed upon others. War has been allowed upon Mars. War has been allowed upon Venus. War has not been allowed where Jupiter is concerned. War has not been allowed where Saturn is concerned, though Saturn has exported its wars or its conflicts elsewhere, including to the Earth. So you see, the energies and the interplays between the planets, between the celestial bodies themselves, create an attraction or a repulsion as well. And these energies then could be said to travel round the solar system as well and to land in particular areas where they can be resolved. You see, think of a tree if you like. The seeds at certain times are scattered to the wind. Well, they are then landing where they can most be implanted, where it can grow. So it is the same with the subject of war or what it wants to discover or what it wants to become. So war is something, the idea of war was implanted upon the earth long ago. And so that then holds that energy that says war sold here or accepted here attracts those beings that wish to play in that theater, you see. So as far back as you might imagine, wars of one kind or another have taken place upon the earth. Now perhaps you will see that all of the elements of the earth are in balance in their own way. But in some ways they also make war upon each other. One eventually yields to the other and wins over. One element, fire may rage, eventually it yields to the waters that extinguish it, you see. In one way or another then, this movement then of energies is that one must overpower the other or control the other. And so when the elements upon the earth have been most in balance, there has been the least amount of war upon the earth. Has there ever been a time when there has been no war at all upon the earth? Yes. There have been short respites of time where there has been no war. However, remember then that its opposite is not peace. That there has been no war does not mean that conflict did not exist. Does not mean that all things got on well. During the times of no war, there were times of great exploration, great introspection, so in many ways there was wars raging within the earth, if you like, within the energies of the earth, the patterns remaking themselves, times of great gestation between the great ages of man. So no wars during this time, but a great amount of energy expelled just the same. In some ways, it can be said that the solar system, this particular solar system, has always had wars somewhere. That is to say that if it was a time of peace or where there was no war upon the earth, then there was war upon Mars or elsewhere. There was a movement from here to there or from there to here. So it is not necessarily that the earth, so rich in resources that were desired by others, that must be claimed for themselves in some way, it is not the richness of the earth that calls upon its own war. It is simply that it is allowed. It is one of the ways in which energies resolve or work themselves out upon the earth. 
Again, some versions of the human being are structured so that war seems as if it will resolve or break through or encourage spiritual growth. You may not think of war or an evolved or conscious being as one that would make war on another, and yet I tell you that of all of the paths that you would consider spiritual paths, the path of war is its own path. It is the path of conflict, resolved based upon the lower mind rather than the higher mind. However, it is the lower mind that knows the way to the higher mind as fast as possible. It is the most direct path from lower to higher. So if one begins from unconsciousness exploring war, it can very quickly move into the higher mind in order to resolve or discover. We are exploring the subject, the concept of war. It is important, therefore, that as you explore this conceptually, you will allow all other things to rest aside. Whether you have good or bad opinions of war, rights and wrongs, and like that. We are here exploring a subject matter. We are raising the ability of your mind then to explore it in a non-judgmental capacity. War upon the earth is influenced by the other celestial bodies upon the earth, those that relate to the earth. That is to say that even if a great deal of humanity may find a peaceful nature within itself or begin to abhor war or have had enough of its atrocities in some way, the earth is still influenced toward that based upon its current relationship with the other planets. That will change and in fact does change during different cycles of evolution, during different movements of the sun. There have been different relationships with the moon, the proximity of the moon, even by a degree or so, will change how one sees oneself and one's world and how much war there is upon the world. The relationship that the earth has with Mars has created more or less war upon the earth. There is a tug, there is a pull, there is energies between the celestial bodies, just as you see that there are energies then between certain individuals that will pull to love or to friendship or to conflict. The celestial bodies then influence each other greatly, much, much more than you imagine now. And because of that, they also influence humanity in that way as well. War is also then influenced by the current calendar that is used upon the earth. Your current Gregorian calendar is one that supports the idea, the concept of war. It is an uneven calendar. It is not governed by the moons or the tides. It is not governed by the more peaceful movement of the cycles within cycles that bring peace to the being. Instead, they govern an erratic heartbeat. The very cycles by the ways that you measure days and weeks and months, in fact, bring about an erratic nature to the mind, an erratic pulse to the heart so that you feel as if you are always catching up to something or attempting to do so, or to fix something or to rectify something. Even how you measure time then, time is measured in such a way as to bring about conflict. Time measures itself in 60-minute intervals or hours, and this particular time scheme of how one hour or one minute is measured is conflicting to the mind and to the more natural cycles and rhythms of the mind. A 60 second minute is a conflicting moment for the mind. 
If time were measured differently, and it will be at one time, then the mind will conceive, will have a concept of a structure that is more supportive of peaceful thoughts. So again, a 60-minute interval, a 60-second interval is stressful to the mind. And under that stress, it begins to look for the conditions that surround it that bring about stress. And so in an effort to lash out against these, war is one of the byproducts, if you like. All this goes by way of saying, then, that it may seem to you that a war takes place because of one maniacal despot here or there that must be set aside, or because of boundary disputes, or all of the other reasons by which man will war upon himself or another. However, here I tell you that instead it is the stress by which time and calendars are measured, as well as the relationship, the current relationship that the earth has with other celestial bodies in the solar system, that give it a penchant toward war. Does this mean that war is inevitable where humanity is concerned? No, not necessarily, because the idea of war then is to resolve, to resolve not to war, to resolve to discover the importance of what war is or how to resolve it or to move from the lower mind to the higher mind. And so as humanity continues to do so, then there will be less war upon the earth. However, now, now in this moment, it is near the end of a great cycle of time, cycles within cycles within cycles, and this particular one, this rather dense one, this rather difficult one, is one that inspires humanity to war or to warlike or to conflicting thoughts. So there is conflict between family members and there is war within families themselves and their structure. And there is war at the workplace and who will take over this or that, who will win and who will lose. The world now wishes to divide itself by winners and losers, victors, oppressors and the oppressed, kings and slaves and such. All of these classifications then wish to be explored or re-evaluated so that they can become something else. War wishes to play itself out now, almost as if it had been prophesied to do. Yes, in the stories that you know of final battlefields and final conflicts, these stories, these histories, these detailed accounts in some ways live within your psyche, within these lower minds as well. The stories have been memorized not only in this lifetime, but in all of the others that you have lived during this great cycle. Every great cycle has a great story to tell and a great theater to tell that story in. So whether or not you think of yourself as a very peacefully minded, conscientious individual in this lifetime, you are still in the story that was written long ago. And in that way, you have been, must be, playing all of the parts. And that is why, even if you believe in peace completely, you will still find conflict within yourself, because the subject matter within that story, the characterizations still exist within you. In some way, they are still playing themselves, revealing themselves. In order to have a war, there must be those that will participate in the war. There must be soldiers, yes. There must be generals and such. So what is a soldier? And who is a soldier? Well, long ago, and even before you took bodies upon the earth, the archetype of what you would consider a soldier to be, that archetype 
was a protector, an energy that protects, an energy that surrounds like a force field and protects. So imagine if there were a force field all around the earth. Well, that is a form of protection. Imagine the rings around Saturn. It is a form of protection as well to the planet. It is not as vulnerable because it is protected by these rings of energy. So soldiers then are energies, were energies that protect those things that are sacred or those things that need protection. What kinds of things need protection? Do all things need protection? No. Some things, some beings, some peoples do not. But there are those things that require protection. Those things that are innocent and unguarded. There are those things that do not have their own protection. It is purposeful for them not to have their own protection, for them not to have fields and layers, boundaries or borders between them or that and something else. Those things need protection. Those beings need protection. And long ago there were certain energies whose job, whose purpose it was to protect. Alongside that, there are certain energies whose purpose it is to provide. To provide. To provide energy. To provide food. To provide sustenance. To provide knowledge. To provide well-being. To provide home. These energies, then, these archetypes existed long ago. Again, we are thinking of archetypes, not yet peoples, not yet beings. All of this was applied much later. Other energies, those that we will call guardians or sentinels, those things that are watchers, those things that are not protecting and not providing, and yet in some way they are present, and their mere presence means something. Imagine a very tall, strong, broad tree that has stood for a very, very long time. What does it do? Well, nothing. It's just a tree. But it is a very large, very ancient, very imposing tree. Its very presence means something. And so there are energies that later became human energies, and these too were guardians or sentinels. Now, about the time that humanity came to be, in order for humanity to embody, to become a physical being in one capacity or another, regardless of the cycle or its physical characteristics, the human being needed to embody based upon archetypes. How did you get a personality, you see? How did personalities evolve? There was not simply a choice of all of the different personalities. These evolved over a great period of time based upon some of the original archetypes. Now, how does an archetype, a great subject of an archetype, then become a human archetype? Well, this is a rather delicate subject, you see. In order for a great or a non-physical or conceptual archetype to become a practical one, it must be corrupted in some way. It must corrode itself. It must corrupt from within. It must implode, if you like, or take all of the great characteristics and also embody its opposites or become in opposition to itself. And so the great archetypes then must invert themselves, turn themselves inside out so that they cannot see their greatness and then incorporate them, which 
corrupts them. So to incorporate, to place into a body, then in order to do that, to make something more dense out of something that has been lighter, something must turn inward. Turning inward into itself, that process makes something more dense. You fold it inward. That process of folding or turning inward can be called a corruption. To corrupt or to incorporate, to take and place that into the body. In order to do that, then, that is how you engage the higher self and the lower self, the higher mind and the lower mind. And the higher must corrupt itself or oppose itself in order to make itself dense. So all of these great energies then, the protectors, the providers, the guardians and sentinels, became physicalized, they became corrupted in essence. And that is how the lower aspect was born. So a great being, for instance, that could not make war upon another because it has been corrupted, now can. And yet, within every soldier-like being, there is still that which protects, provides, that which sets free, that which guards another, and that which has a goal of finding the uncorrupted or setting all things free or setting to right. So what is <clears throat> a soldier then? A soldier is still a protector, a provider, a guardian, a sentinel, and that archetype lives within these beings so that in some way that is what they choose to express. You see? So a soldier is not one that approves of war. A soldier is one that approves of the protection and all that goes about the higher ideals. Soldiers then live for a very high, a very mindful, a very purposeful idea. And yes, some are more corrupted than others, meaning that they carry these ideals of long ago at a deeper place within the lower mind and their journey is a little bit longer. So here you find very great beings, I tell you. Very conscious and very conscientious beings. Now, soldiers are not necessarily violent beings. In fact, for the most part, they are not. They are not violent. They do not approve of violence. They do not approve of killing or of taking a life. However, the higher ideals that they live for allow for this. Again, I remind you that we are exploring here a concept. A concept to explore it fairly must always be explored without judgment with a great amount of creativity, with affinity for the idea itself. Soldiers, then, do not approve of killing. They allow it because it serves a higher ideal or a higher purpose. It serves a collective purpose. Soldiers are not simply mindless robotons who follow orders. In fact, they have very high ideals that were placed within them long and longer ago than you can imagine by great energies, by great sentinel energies. And they have been imbued with these purpose. And it is one of the ways in which they upon the earth work out aspects that other versions of humankind do not wish to because humanity is a true part of a great collective. Because of that great collective, then, is why humanity learns from those that do what others cannot do. It is well to explore other aspects of the subject 
of war as well. Violence, for instance, is violence a kind of war? No. Violence is always violence against oneself. It appears that it may be against another. A violent act is always a violent act against oneself. It always causes great harm to oneself. Regardless of what it will look like, and even if it takes the life of another, a violent act brings about harm to oneself, to one's soul, to one's heart, to one's spirit. So it is one of the ways in which humanity discovers another form of purpose is by perpetrating a violent act. Violence and war are not the same. A violent act may take place as a cause of war, but violence for the sake of violence is an act against one's self and one's personal discovery and one's personal journey. And so there is a movement toward a discovery in that area as well. Earlier we have said that there are certain cosmic or genetic codes that in some way then affect who is capable of making war or bringing about harm or resolving in this particular way. That is correct. There is a certain percentage of the population that varies with time of who or what is capable of making war or becoming a soldier. For instance, I will tell you that now upon the earth there is a great percentage of the population that is capable of a violent act, and yet there is a much lower percentage of the population that is capable of becoming a soldier. So you see again, those that are capable of violence and those that become soldier and perform in this capacity may be, and in fact are, completely different sorts of individuals. The genetic codes then of long ago also have much to do with how much time has been spent upon the earth and upon other warlike planets, lifetimes upon warlike planets compared to other planets that have much less of this. For instance, those that have spent a great deal of time upon the earth and Mars and Venus are more likely to understand conflict, studied conflict resolution, been in some ways a soldier, and in other ways then also found themselves back into a love or an understanding of humanity. So a soldier then, again, is a very unique type of individual. It is an archetype of sorts that embodies all that we have said otherwise. Whereas those that are simply carrying a genetic code that is predisposed to violence, that is another particular archetype. That is one that is currently in conflict and remaking itself in uncertainty. There are different boundaries here. What if we were to add to this mix the subject of gang warfare? Those that make war, but in their own private wars, if you like. Well, in some ways, yes. Here you have as well those that are uncertain about what they remember about war and what they remember about being soldiers and what they remember about purpose. Many of those then that participate in today's true gang activities in this way, in this subculture where it is an unofficial war or not a government-sanctioned war, those that participate by these means then are ones that are attempting to remember, to reawaken and to reestablish what they have learned about this subject what kind of soldiers they are. They are reestablishing their ideals. What true ideals does someone live for? So it is an unofficial 
battle, if you like, a battle for one's own spirit or a battle for one's own accomplishments. It is a test in some way. It is initiations in some way. That is why many who join gangs later renounce them because they begin to remember what the higher ideals are that they had already learned. They remember, they become conscious about it and they take those higher ideals into other aspects of society. Many of the aspects of your cultures and subcultures that are difficult for a personality to understand. If you were to remove yourself from the smaller idea and again see the larger conceptual idea, indeed you would remember and understand a great deal more. It is important then to consider the idea of the earth as well. Does war upon the earth harm the earth itself? Well, in essence, no. The earth is not harmed by wars upon it. However, because it affects the lower nature of things versus the higher nature of things, the more wars that there are upon the earth, the more lower the nature of all things upon the earth also are or express themselves. Again, it does not harm the earth itself. Weapons or death, killing, or any of the forms that war will take. It does not harm the earth per se. However, it affects all of the kingdoms and all of the elements by making all things a little bit lower on a scale, if you like. And so it slows down evolution in that particular way, in the way that it does. It makes it sticky and sluggish. It leaves the elements a little bit out of balance or struggling in their own way to restore balance in their own ways as well. So in places in which there is a great deal of war, the elements will also be much more out of balance. There will tend to be more earthquake, more weather anomaly, more shortages of this or that in war-ravaged areas, not simply because there is a war there, but because the elements and the kingdoms also then must reflect this through a lower nature. So you see, the earth is affected by war in terms that all things are, but not exactly in that way that you might imagine where the earth itself is harmed in the process. Will humanity take war elsewhere to other planets out into space? Yes, it will. It will attempt to. It will attempt to take it elsewhere by claiming certain space or by using space to in some way engage, weaponize, weaponizing the earth itself. This will not be long live for the attempt will not be entirely successful but when humanity moves beyond its own boundaries beyond the boundaries of the earth in this case and out into space with a lower energy then a higher energy will move against it if you like to oppose it these are based upon certain universal laws, if you like, extending far and into the solar system and beyond it as well. The more compressed or kept down to the earth that war is, the more that it is allowed. The more the energy extends or attempts to expand itself, well, that stretching effect then will meet its opposition. And so it will then come crashing down to earth as it will be and another cycle or another segment will begin from there. So war exists conceptually, physically. It will continue into the foreseeable future. Violence is not the same 
as war. A war is a violent act, but a violent act and war are not the same. Humanity in its variety of genetic codes will opt at times for war and at times against it. And yes, the earth is capable of long lasting peace within certain parameters. In order for there to be long lasting peace upon the earth, there must be more awareness of who and what humanity is, of the value of life itself, of the resources by which the earth offers itself. In order for there to be long time, long term peace upon earth, the calendars must need to be structured differently and the earth in relationship to the other planets must be better understood. The purpose of the ensouling of a human being within a human body or the value of a human life must be better understood. And there are periods and cycles in which this takes place and periods and cycles in which it does not. Currently, humanity explores a time when it does not or has not, but it is now moving into a different time and space, into a different perspective. Remember that earlier I have said that in order to know something or to become a soldier as were, that something must be corrupted. Well, in opposition to that, there is the reflex then that knows how to undo that or unmake that. To uncorrupt something means to purify it, to refresh it, to restore it. And so humanity moves to do that as well now, to restore itself by bringing then a new energy or a new truth or by reconciling the lower mind and the higher mind. And another way by which to complete the cycle is by introducing new and different archetypes to the earth. New archetypes for a new cycle to complete this theater, to complete this chapter, this story, to complete war for the sake of completing war. Not by declaring a victor, but by recognizing that the chapter itself is complete. So by purifying, the act of purifying, if you like. When you think of something as simple as a baptism, if you like, it is a rite, it is a purification rite, and it restores one to one's natural ability or to one's higher truth. One is freed from the past and begins anew. One is anointed into the new. Wars will end that suddenly, that simply and that suddenly. Energies will come to the earth that simply anoint humanity with a new and the next energy, with the new and the next age. And the great purifier of energy will come to the earth as it always has, purifying thoughts and feelings and bringing a different energy. And that which has been corrupted will become purified and become something else entirely, as will humanity. As the human being restructures itself, and begins to call upon the new and the different archetypes. Although it is a subject for another day, those beings that you call the indigos, well, they are the ushers then. They are the ushers of the next or the new wave of archetypes. They are not an archetype themselves. They are the ushers of these archetypes. They will bring them, they will hold them, they will nurture them, they will remind others. By way of saying again, this is a great time upon the earth and a time whose end has come. A time, a measure of time whose end has come. 
a measure of the expression of the discovery of those aspects of conflict, for instance, whose time has come to an end. So it is the end times, the ending of times, the ending of thoughts related to these times. And so wars will not suddenly come to an end all on one day, and yet you will see that they will be moved, they will be changed, that the very purpose by which one sees wars or battle will change as well. And you will begin to see this change when you begin to see new and unique, true leaders come to the earth. That is when you will see that wars will end. Currently, you have generals and you have presidents, but you do not have leaders upon the earth. True leaders and leadership, those are the purifiers, you see. So your purifiers have not yet made their presence known upon the earth, but they will. They will. We have explored this subject then. It is a rather grand subject. So much more could be said about this, but the same is true of other subjects that we have explored as well. Let there be peace among us then. Let there be peace among humanity, peace within your thoughts, within the extensions of your thoughts, and peace as you explore this concept, for it is simply that, one equal to all the others. I bid you good day.